Episode 16, The Paradox. Welcome to The Paradox with your attending, Dr. Eric Larson. He is a practicing anesthesiologist and clinical assistant professor at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. Listen in as he takes you behind the scenes of what practicing medicine in today's ever-changing world is like with another doctor. The Paradox is a fun and accidentally informative show for physicians, patients, or anyone who has ever found themselves in a waiting room. Welcome to The Paradox. This is your host, Dr. Eric Larson. I want to welcome you back if you are a long-time listener. I guess long time. It's only been 16 episodes, right? Uh, if you're a new listener, thank you so much for joining me. I think you'll enjoy the show. It's got some great content today. And uh, I'd like encourage you to go back to some previous episodes, look at the titles, and find a couple that you find interesting. I think there are a lot of things there for about anybody. Uh, the show is geared not just for physicians, but also for people who are interested in medicine, who may know a physician, which is about all of us, right, on some level. Uh, and a better way to get a window into what it's like in the trenches of medicine. We're going to delve into issues that probably people aren't talking about many other places. Usually we talk about healthcare delivery systems and how things come in between the patient-physician relationship. Today's going to be a little different. Today we're going to have a little bit more fun. We're going to talk about doctorpreneurs, people who are physicians who started their own businesses or lines of products. And this is not, again, not just for physicians because I think a lot of the lessons learned here in these discussions can be applied to anyone in any sort of business. And so if you're thinking about launching a product, or if you're certainly if you're a physician and you think there's a void in the market or there's something that would be helpful to you or, or your patients, uh, this will be a great episode to listen to, get a little how-to, and find about some of the potential pitfalls you may face in the development of your product. As always, I encourage you to go to patreon.com slash the paradox. There you can become a patron supporter of the show. For just a few dollars a month, you can support the show and help it grow. As bonus content... For the Patreon page, I'm going to be putting my appearance on the podcast Lines of Liberty, which I was featured and we talked about politics and certainly a little bit about medicine, of course. Uh, but it's an interesting discussion and it's worth just a couple bucks a month to get that extra access to see a little bit more about what it's like behind the microphone. As always, show notes can be found at theparadox.com slash 016. There you can find the website that we mentioned, the links and the various products from Dr. Dana Rice and Dr. John Renucci. They are the stars of the show this episode. So Dr. Rice is a urologist, and we'll talk about pee, and Dr. Renucci is a plastic surgeon, and we'll talk about skin. So you'll find out more about their products in just a moment. Before I go, I'd like to encourage you to look for your feed next week on Wednesday for episode 17. It's going to be an episode again back about medicine, but this is going to be one that's going to probably be easily the most haunting episode I've had, and um, maybe horrifying. I'm not sure exactly what superlative it would best uh, fit the episode, but you absolutely want to tune in, and I think it's one you want to share with your friends, and uh, it's something we need to make sure everyone's aware of because it's super important. But I don't want to leave you on that down note. We're going to have fun with this episode. We're going to talk about pee and skin. What could be more fun? So without further ado, Dr. Dana Rice and Dr. John Rucci. Enjoy. Hi, this is Dr. Eric Larson at The Paradox. I'm with my new friend, Dr. Dana Rice, who's a urologist in the Washington, D.C. area. Thank you, Dr. Rice, for joining me. Hi, thank you very much for having me. And today we're going to have a little bit different show, but we're not going to be focusing so much on the delivery of healthcare and the problems therein, which there are plenty, and we have more plenty of episodes in the future we can talk about those things. Today we're going to talk about something a little different. This is probably more geared towards pretty much physicians, in the sense that we're going to talk about what physicians are doing outside their sort of normal job structure. So this is like the entrepreneur who starts up their own business. And so my first guest is Dr. Dana Rice. Like I said, she's the urologist in DC, and she created an app called the UTI Tracker. So she's a urologist, so she knows a little bit about urine. <laughs> so we're going to talk about <laughs> those sorts of things today. Uh, it's been out for a while. And so I want to just ask a couple questions. So when other physicians are looking to start this kind of wanting to figure out how you got to where you were. So why did you talk about what made you decide to develop this? And then we'll go in from there. Okay, so sure, no problem. First of all, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. I've listened to a few of your other episodes and I appreciate what you're doing. Oh, thanks so much. Yep. 
and then for physicians and other people listening. So I went into this as sort of a save the world, thought it was a need and a medical thing that I was going to do for my patients. And then it sort of morphed into a business. So I've had an interesting perspective as I've gone along about how to do this, because in medicine and residency, we're trained in a lot of different ways to put together the book work and the education and things like that. But business is just a whole other animal. Mm -hmm. So I actually... In residency, I wrote a chapter on urinary tract infections, and as a female, I've had urinary tract infections, and so have all my girlfriends. And then also, I happen to have vesicle ureter reflux, and so does my daughter. So when she was born, we had to catheterize her. So sort of through all this process, I have a lot of familiarity with urine, as you said. (laughs) And I thought to myself, there's so much bad information out there. How can I put together good information in one place? And back in 2011 or 12, when I was first thinking about it, I thought it'd be nice if there was a website. And then, you know, in residency, you don't have time to do anything. Right. So I kind of put it on hold. And then when I had my second child, I had six weeks off from maternity and I kind of got bored as most surgeons probably do when they're sitting around. I won't say doing nothing. It was work, but compared to my surgical load, newborn was not as bad. So I had free time to kind of mind wander and all those hours. And I thought at that time, apps were coming out. And I was like, you know what, if I just had an app to do this, I could make an app, I could give it to my patients, they would have my speech all in one place and good information and education. So I kind of put it together for that reason. And then as I started to put it together, I was like, everyone needs this, it would help physicians, it would help patients, it would help everybody. So then we worked out on how to do it and put it in market and we can talk about all that. But that was sort of the motivation about it. Let's get good information out there for both physicians and patients because, you know, no one really likes UTIs. It's really kind of painful for everybody. 60% of women have UTIs. So that's how I came about doing it. And then the app itself, we can talk about how the nitty gritties if you like, but that was my motivation. Well, um, so the great thing about capitalism, right, is that you find uh, some sort of need. And, and the only way you, make, you become rich in capitalism is if you actually produce something that helps people, which is great, which is great. And so, and so you found basically you, you found something that you thought would, you know, there's a, you had a need for this and it yeah. wasn't in it. And you weren't, you initially weren't going towards to the monetization of it, the product. You're just like, I just need something helpful so I can, my patients can keep track of their voiding, which is peeing for, the, right. for the physicians. Right. And so. And so you just have a, your app essentially just is a way of keeping track of, of timing and sort of symptoms when you're peeing, right? I mean, that's kind of... Correct. So you're, just for people who don't know about urinary tract infections, basically, if you can figure out what your triggers are while you get them, and if you figure out, you know, incontinence, how often you need to pee when you leak, there's a lot of different sort of diary components that go into it. And a lot of females already track their periods and are kind of used to the diary method, right? So this was putting in that diary method. And then from a physician perspective, it's painful to talk to your patients for a long time about how do you pee? Do you sit, you know, you have sex with, yada, yada. So it's a good way for physicians to be like, here, go read the education center and set your, you know, set your app to beep every two hours so you can remember to do time voiding by getting a text message and then bring back your calendar that tells me when your periods were, when you had sex and when it burns, and then we'll go from there. So I put it together for that. And then as you said, with capitalism, initially I thought it was going to be free and kind of give it out and I was just happy to do it. And the feedback we got from tester groups was no doctor would ever do that. We don't believe it's a true app. So right. Why doesn't it cost something? And then once we got that feedback, I was like, oh, okay. And then my husband, who's in sales and marketing, was like, let's do this. And that's kind of how we got into it. So that's really cool. So, um, so the, the, uh, my wife's a pediatrician, like I might have mentioned to you when we were talking beforehand. And um, this is the sort of thing that she, I mean, she doesn't deal with, but she definitely has lots of little girls who have UTIs. And like you said, there's the, the problems with the sphincters and all the, and backflow and those sorts of problems. And so these are the things that I imagine your app is probably for the pediatric population too, right? It's not just for adults. Yeah, you can use it for anything because, you know, as a mom of a kid who has UTIs, like I happen to be a urologist, so I can deal with it on a regular basis. But if I was not a urologist, I would have been so neurotic because they ask you questions like, oh, do you know if your kid was not sleeping the night before they had a UTI or do you have a fever? Oh, boy. And it's kind of all relevant because it gets into if it's, you know, a kidney infection versus a bladder infection. But 
who the heck knows? And then, especially in the pediatric world, your pediatrician will treat your kid, but you may end up in an urgent care or you may end up somewhere else. And if you don't have your culture results, that really changes how your kid gets treated over time. So this would let the moms enter in their cultures, the antibiotic resistance, all that kind of stuff to hopefully avoid antibiotic resistance and more infections down the line. So just a way, oh, the, the one-stop place to kind of keep track of all this stuff, this right exactly. all the information that you go see some new person who's on call or whatever they it makes it easy for them to get the information they need exactly um so so you came up with this idea uh while you're changing diapers yeah and uh then you're then you then you go into the phase where you, you develop the app so how did you get to the point where you developed it because right I guess you're not a programmer and it sounds like your husband's not either yeah and so you're as we, we describe you as an anesthesiologist, we describe you all just as glorified plumbers. Yes, um, we are. <laughs> right? I mean, pretty much. Yep. And so, and so uh, you obviously didn't have any you know, skill in this thing. So how did you find someone and was that an easy th- process? Yeah. So it actually ended up working out fine for me and not being that difficult, but I kind of lucked into it. So as you said, like once I realized it should be an app and not a website, I had to change my thinking. So back in residency, I was I kind of wrote the education center and what I would want to include in a website format. And I had it all sketched out in one of those good old-fashioned moleskin notebooks that every resident carries with their case log, right? <laughs> so, so I had that on paper. And then I'm attorney and I was like, oh no, apps are the way to go now. What I did is I thought to myself, how do I make this happen? And my husband, who like I said, He's in sales and advertising in DC on Untap Magazine, and he has some graphic designer friends that work for the magazine. I see. And they are techie people. So they put me in contact with some developers. And at that point, I actually had a patient who had started an app himself. And I was talking to him because I knew he had started an app. And he was like, The first thing you need to do is hire a lawyer. And I was like, What are you talking about? He's like, Well, any. Any person that you talk to about your product, they can take your intellectual property right. and then you're screwed. So he was like, you need to make sure you get a non-compete before you even start to talk to developers. And to be truthful, that could have happened to me because the first couple of developers that I sort of talked to were just friends of friends. And if they hadn't mm. been trustworthy people, they probably could have rolled with an idea or a similar idea and I would have had no no recourse. Sure. So that's, okay. how, so that's how I first got into it. And then once I got a non-compete, I started to interview developers. And like I said, I had the connection through my husband. So I had a few people here in the States. Um, but a lot of people use overseas developers. Um, India is a big place because they make cheaper apps. Sure. So this is something that I think most patients don't realize uh, is that we actually pay attention to what you do. And when you, and we learn a lot from patients about stuff that's not div- related to medicine. Oh yeah. And I found a good fishing hole from a patient once and a, <laughs> he happened to fish in a lake. I, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff I've, you know, I found other people who can help do work in my house or something like that. So, you know, we're actually people too. So if you ever feel like <laughs> divulging a little bit more, actually, you know, there's oftentimes a good connections can be made. You can actually network within the exam room out, oh. while you're being, while you're being treated for your plumbing problems. Yeah, I agree. It's it's the best. Well, especially in urology, right? Like, if you're not making small chat, it's just awkward. Right. Right. So <laughs> it's, it's sort of like the colorectal guys. It's also, <laughs> although I don't. There's there's a point where you probably shouldn't be talking too much. But yeah, right. Um, <laughs> so uh, so you developed the app and you've launched it. It's been out for a little over a year now. And so, what is a what's the next step for you? Are you looking to make a new app? Or are you gonna do more things with different things? Well, so this is kind of funny you ask. So initially when I, when I realized an app was the way to go and this was what to do and UTIs are obviously ripe for the picking, right? So 60% of women have UTIs. It's really heavily college based and then perimenopausal. Right. Those are big users of technology. And I kind of thought that I would just put it out there and it would blow up. Like every sorority girl, every college girl across America would download it because <laughs> can keep you out of an ER and it can tell you when you need to see your doctor and it can give you over the counter preventative tips, right? So I did not realize everything that goes into making an app. So when I first started, I thought I'd do the UTI tracker app and then I would do one for back pain and I would make a whole suite of apps for doctors to have this convenient thing. Because one of the things that's nice for me is 
my patients will come in with a calendar printed out with all their symptoms, all their everything that I can read, I can follow it. It makes sense. And it actually makes my life easy too. So I was thinking that I would do that for lots of different kind of chronic issues. Right. But I did not realize how much goes into making an app, how much it costs to make an app. And then on the back end now, the marketing, the podcast, the other side of things, which are great opportunities, but I'm, I'm a surgeon. I like to operate. I work 110 hours a week on patient load. You know, well, not now. I'm an attending. I work less than that. But in residency, <laughs> you know, we were doing that. So, but still, I mean, I have a full-time, you know, six to six, 12-hour day job, calls on nights and weekends, yeah. and this is a hobby. Yeah, and, and you've got two munchkins, which is a... Uh... At, at at a minimum, a, a very uh, time-consuming hobby as well. So, yeah. Um, so then, it, now that you have these apps, again, you're going to look. You're you're marketing now. So if we're if you're a physician looking to say, hey, I'm going to I've got this idea. So we're going to talk about apps just because there are a lot of things. As you said, that's a lot of people look to their phone and they use things. So you're going to get you want to get an attorney first. Then you have to find a developer, and then you have to market it. Right. So that's sort of the three steps. Do you market, do you hire someone for the marketing? I mean, I know your husband's sort of, in that, it's sort of in that, but he's probably not in this sort of sphere, right? So what do you, yeah. how have you gone about this besides talking to guys like me? Yeah, so I really haven't done that yet. So what I've learned from this is that marketing is a full-time job. So if, uh, you, if you want to hire someone to market, um, do marketing, it, it's extremely expensive. So we've been doing a lot of sort of, Twitter, Instagram, things on our own and sort of soft marketing. But in hindsight, what we should have done is we should have started the marketing when I was still in the development phase and built up hype about the app and about the product and then did kind of a soft launch, get the word out there and then go from there is what I think I would recommend to an up and coming um, entrepreneur. Because I think that trying to catch up now on the back end I don't think it's impossible, but it's kind of like a daily struggle. Most people say it takes three years for a small business to kind of hit its stride. And there are a lot of other female physicians out there that I've been talking to and kind of learning from. And quite a few of them have quit their practice altogether. And their product is their full-time job. And it's a busy full-time job for them to do marketing and circuits and things like that. So I can honestly say we have not put in enough of an effort, but I'm young in my career and I am not going to give up operating. I would love for the app to take off, but to be honest, even if the app took off, I would still operate full time. I, I love what I do. Yeah. Well, and the same thing with me. I mean, if this podcast suddenly made a million dollars, and by the way, if you go to patreon.com slash the paradox, you're welcome to donate, <laughs> donate as much as you want. <laughs> but uh, so Jeff Bezos, if you're out there listening, you know, I'm your friend. Uh, so uh, I would still continue doing anesthesia because I really enjoy it. Um, I enjoy hanging out with urologists and other sur- and orthopedic surgeons and other people because, I mean, I don't know, it'd be kind of weird not having, being around, taking care of patients and stuff at this point in my, in my life. I mean, you know, I'm yeah. middle age, unfortunately now. So um, I actually applaud you for you for what you're doing. And when I've listened to your podcast, I've noticed before, I have found the one thing that I am terrible at is I cannot push myself or sell my product. I have a very hard time doing that. So even when I'm talking to people who I know probably could do it, I, it just feels awkward for me to be like, go buy my app. Like this oh, is right. So that is one thing too, that I think physician entrepreneurs need to be very aware about. There is a very different part of a sales sort of mentality than there is a physician mentality. Cause we, at least I, I think as a surgeon, I don't normally sell my surgeries, right? I I tell you what my recommendations are and I tell you why I'm, I guess I sell myself a little bit why I'm good at it, but like I'm not pushing anybody to do a surgery they don't want to have. Like I make sort of textbook recommendations and you choose me or you don't. Right. Um, But when it comes to the app or any kind of interviews or things like that, it's definitely better to be more, Hey, my product's the best support me. This is the way to go. And that's been a bit of a struggle too. Cause my husband always yells at me. He's like, you didn't sell that. Oh, well, and, and I think, so I actually, in a, in a, a moment of, um, uh, I guess you'd say a lack of insight, I actually ran for public office in 2010 uh, for state representative. I We call it the near miss in my family where I lost by just a couple percent. So I ended up continuing to practice. 
but the, the point is, is that was, again, that was me going out and you're selling yourself at the door. Uh, yeah. Then you also have to call people and ask for money. And that's really hard. Oh, I can't that's bet. something, you know, I mean, no, and you ask any candidate and they're just like, that's the worst part. Anyway, you get on the phone and, you know, getting people to send money. It's really hard. The, the, only, the great thing about what you're doing, what you're doing, and I feel like what I'm doing is that it, for me, it seems a lot easier to sell because you created something that it, you, that you really believe is a great product or great, great thing or it's something you really enjoy or it's fun for me. And so it's not hard for me to go in the OR and say, hey, you got to listen to this episode or, you know, you'll be the smartest person to block about drug shortage if you listen to episode five, for instance, right? I mean, there are all kinds of things I can tell people. And, um, and for you, I mean, I almost think you're probably, your test, your market really is, is physicians, right? It's almost more hitting those primary care physicians um, to say, hey, this is, this is a great way for you to help your patients find out, you know, track things and take care of themselves. And, and it, but of course you got to get the the you've got to get to the physicians right I and mean, that's probably the hardest part. But I would think that'd be an easier way to market than going to try and get the patients because people don't ever think about like boy I've got you know burning when I pee. I mean, what is an app about that? I don't think this problem that comes to people. Well, that's the thing is so we have reached out to some physicians, but it's true like selling yourself to other professionals is a little strange because I don't want them to be like, oh, she's the urologist that's sold out and is trying to do this. Like, nope, this is a ha- This is a hobby on my own. So that's kind of interesting. And then as far as reaching out to the demographic, you would be surprised what college girls Google at two in the morning when they burn. <laughs> Having been a college girl, I wish I had the internet. I'm just a little too old for that. Yeah, right. Uh, so. Well, I would say that you should just look at your product very much similar to a book. There's probably you probably would not hesitate to tell people if you wrote a book about something or a chapter on urinary tract infections that you would tell people, hey, I've got a lot of things on exactly you know what sort of the process for UTIs and how you can keep track of things. You should read my chapter. You probably wouldn't ever think about think twice about recommending that. Right, you're right. And, I would. So that's really what you do. I mean, except now you instead of buying the whole damn book, you just buy one chapter. <laughs> you just buy so. It's a lot easier to sell, and and you've got something that's really focused exactly, laser focused to exactly what people are you know dealing with, and like you said, super common problem. So, well, if people want to find your app, where do they go? So the best way to go is Apple um, iTunes Store or Google Play, and you can search by UTI Tracker. Um, I'm also on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, and I'm Dr. Dana Rice, and on Facebook we have UTI Tracker. Um, it has its own business page as well. So it's both my business and myself. Um, and the links are all the same. So you say on Facebook, you're on your Facebook. It's UTI tracker. Okay. Okay. I gotcha. Um, and then on Twitter and Instagram, um, UTI tracker exists as well, but so do I, I'm, I'm Dr. Dana Rice. I don't, um, I don't exist on Facebook in the public because otherwise my mother would have trouble not getting my kids pictures and I don't post my kids pictures everywhere. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Uh, and so, and it's, and the, the price is, it's, uh, what is it? 399. Is that right? For the, yeah, app? it's 399 and it's a one-time fee. I don't have add-ons or upgrades or things like that yet. Um, ultimately a, a sort of pipe dream for me would be have, um, a research database where we could kind of solve, um, you know, world health, multi-drug resistant antibiotic resistance, um, by pulling what people's are treated with way antibiotics for their infection, but that was a build in that costs a bajillion dollars. So I haven't gotten that far in the process yet. Um, so, so, Oh, I was just going to say, so uh, Jeff, if you're listening, um, after you send me the million, make sure you send Dana a bazillion, a bajillion so she can get, so we can solve the problems of urinary tract infections in the world. <laughs> Anything else you want to add before we go? Nope. I would just like to say thank you so much for having me on. I think this is a great podcast for physicians to listen to. If you haven't listened to other episodes, I would recommend it. Although, do not drive when you're listening to the one about the American um, internal the, medicine. Yeah, oh, episode nine. Oh, I was I so frustrated in that. And I'm driving on the highway to work around the Beltway in D.C. And I was like, no, no. I'm like yelling at myself. I'm like, all right, you got to calm down. <laughs> so this is probably not a good time for me to tell you how much they pay the, the president of the American Board of Urology. Oh, I'm sure it's retired surgeon, retired general surgeon. I believe I heard it was like about three quarters of a million dollars. Yeah, that doesn't surprise for like 20 hours of work. Really? 20 hours a week. Yeah. Wait, is that Derek? Got no, no, no. He's I can't even. That's I don't what know. I was told by a urologist. So I I can't verify this, but that's what, 
that's what a urologist who I was working with the other day was telling me because we talk about, I mean, we've talked about MOC a bunch and it's really bad for urologists. I mean, it was really, there's a lot that's involved for you guys too. And so I, I don't want to get off on it. Yeah, no worries. I was going to say, don't, don't get me going. But, it's already frustrating enough to take the test. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, I actually, there's a bunch of simulations I've got to do for my anesthesia. So not looking forward to those, but I guess at some point, maybe, uh, I guess, listen to the end of, if you can make it through right episode nine and get to the end where they, where Dr. Fisher talks about how you can contribute to the, um, to the court case to the, I guess that they're, this, they're suing the, one of the, the boards. Uh, contribute. And I think, you know, we're get, they're getting close to their goal and so they can start that class action lawsuit, which will hopefully free us a little bit. <laughs> Eric, you know what I probably should say about the app before my husband will kill me? Oh, um, absolutely. I, I want to try and maintain marital stability. Yeah. Here. <laughs> he, would, he would tell me to let people know that if anyone's interested in any kind of, um, you know, business cards, handouts so they could give their patients or any information, we're happy to mail that to people. And that if they want to sort of talk to me or communicate with me about how the app helps them educate their patients um, with a lot less work just to reach out and let us know because we're definitely interested in talking to patients, educating, getting word out there, making it easy for physicians too to use the program. Is there an address that we can put out publicly for that yeah. to, to mail in- for inquiries? <laughs> Info at utitracker.com. Because I am fairly certain my wife's practice would be interested in that sort of thing. Absolutely. If anyone is interested, if they just email there and the email address and just say, you know, rat cards, business cards, whatever they want, we're happy to happy to do that. And then I'm really happy if there's, you know, student health docs listening or camp nurses or things like that. I think it's important to get the younger generation involved too, because that's where so many women have problems and they don't talk about it. So, so many women kind of suffer with these recurrent UTIs because nobody goes and asks someone who has dealt with it before. They get information from the other 16-year-old or 18-year-old and <laughs> round and round they go, right? And if you just ask a doctor, it would probably be cleared up a lot quicker. Right. Well, the 16 to 18-year-olds eight year old, rarely see a doctor and uh, it's not exactly something you talk about in polite conversation, right? Uh, it, it, it should be. I mean, with all this, you know, Me Too, women's health, all that stuff, 60% of women have a UTI. Why are people not talking about it? Well, I mean, you know, there are a lot of things that I, we don't talk about. Like, I would say miscarriage is one we don't talk about too, right? A hundred percent. And when you have one, and my wife and I went through this, we had one of our first, and it, then you find, a, you know, a bajillion people who've had miscarriages suddenly. And, and it was, you just think you're the only one. And then you mentioned like, oh yeah, we had one or two. And so there are a lot of things and we don't talk about, we, maybe we should, I don't know. I mean, I guess I don't particularly want to talk about UTIs with people very frequently, but I guess, I guess we should feel more comfortable uh, but men will talk about erectile dysfunction until they're blue in their face with their friends. I haven't had that. <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're too young. I'm too <laughs> Don't young. Don't worry. Right. You'll get to an age yeah. where you will. No, and, and I was thinking as, as I was uh, getting ready for this interview and it's about UTIs and stuff, and you, were, and you were talking about putting the kids down and you've got a two and five year old. I thought, you know, it's funny because you go the, for the first like five or six years of these kids' lives, you, because you usually have a bunch of little kids. You are totally consumed by sleep and um, bowel movements and and peeing. It like is it it's t- all you can think about is like are they pooping up? Do they need some prunes? Do you know, do they, are they, you know, they and they poop <laughs> over their shoulders and all this kind of stuff. Which and then it's then you have this long reprieve. And then I think when you get to the end of your life, you're in the same boat. <laughs> you focus <laughs> on your sleep, you're pooping and you're peeing too at the end. So you got it anyway. <laughs> I, again, Dr. Rice, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And best of luck to you on the UTI tracker. And I would recommend everyone go to UTI, find the UTI tracker at the Apple Store. It's only okay. four bucks, right? Yep. UTITracker.com will have all the links too. Perfect. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Welcome back again to the Paradox. Dr. Eric Larson here. I'm with my really good friend, Dr. John Renucci. John and I have worked together for 13, 13 14 plus. years, right? I think I started working at your plastic surgery center. Pretty much when you started, because I remember you talking about overhead and trying to figure all that sort of stuff oh, out. Yeah, that was a process. <laughs> <laughs> it's far more complicated than it is for anesthesia because, you know, we just have a billing office and that's pretty much it as far as an overhead standpoint. But I know you were getting out and you're just signing contracts and you're, you had your boards, I think. So I think you probably had, maybe you were practicing a year before I got there. I'm not Yeah, right around sure. 2003 is when I started. Yeah, so about a year before. And I think I started in your clinic probably around 2005 or so. Yeah. So for us, you know, we, in residency, we learn about plastic surgery and, 
and the art of plastic surgery, but not the business side of things. So that's right. what I was kind of navigating <laughs> through the process of all the moving parts in a private practice with the operating suites and, yeah, and the I mean, nurses and well, there's a ton of overhead, right? I mean, yeah. <clears throat> even more than like in a in my wife's at practice where she has an office. I mean, you had an office and then you had an operating suite on top of that with and all our the supplies spa and our estheticians and all the the skincare supplies and I mean, there's a lot of moving parts there. Right, a lot more parts than there are for the other parts. Well, we're not here to talk about plastic surgery specifically. Uh, you are a plastic surgeon. Great job. I'd highly recommend them for anyone who's in the Grand Rapids area or anyone in the group. They do a great job. Yeah, our practice Uh, is great. And full disclosure, uh, so we're going to talk today about um, a product you developed. And the whole point of this episode is we're going to talk about physicians who sort of step outside of medicine in a sense and look at other ways of sort of getting themselves out there and, you know, not just doing medical stuff. And so... You're obviously outside the usual physician setting in the sense that you don't deal with third-party payers that much. I mean, you certainly have, you certainly use commercial payers and things like that, but a lot of cosmetic surgeries, obviously, cash pay. Correct, yeah. I mean, our our main, I mean, in our medical reconstructive part, that's the the, uh, insurance base, but the private practice-based cosmetic surgery is more cash pay. Right, and and that's sort of, I mean, if you look at other people in medicine, maybe ophthalmologists, if they're doing lots of LASIK surgery, there are a lot, there are a couple places where you don't have a lot of third party pairs, but in that sense, you're a little bit different than other physicians that I'll, that I talk to. Correct. Yeah. Um, but we're going to talk about the, the other thing that you, the venture you started, how many years ago now? Uh, the concept, uh, started in 2008. Okay. So you developed a line called Turo, which is a, um, Men's initially started as men's skincare sort of product, right? Right, and full disclosure, I do use your skin oh, skincare great. stuff. Perfect. <laughs> but this, That's great, and it works fine. It's great. I just use the. I'm pretty dumb, so I just put this stuff on my face just for. It actually works great as sunscreen. But this is not this is not an episode to to sell your product, to sell so the to product, speak. Right? Yeah. No. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah. Uh, but we're talking about sort of the process, and so. You said you started in 2008, so you've been in practice at that point almost five years, almost right? Five years. So, what did you, what got you to, I guess, where's initial, where did the initial sort of idea start, and and why don't you go through that story first? Yeah. So, uh, you know, as a plastic surgeon and many parts of, of medicine, we realize the the benefits and merits of of keeping your skin healthy with good uh, good quality skin care and sun protection. Um, it wasn't, I didn't develop a product because I wanted to start a company. The idea was that I was struggling with getting men at the beginning, men to be compliant with skincare. Um, and part of that is that most of the skincare products that are on the market now have 30, 40, 50 SKUs, items to use. And a lot of men really don't want to use many products in a given day. Oh, I see. So you're talking about like using six at once for at night you know, or something. They do a cleanser, a moisturizer, antioxidants. Oh, you know, yeah. Skincare lines are set up to have multiple steps. And so um, the, the concept was that, you know, if you look statistically, women in general will put on 17 to 20 products on their face daily. Whoa. That's mascara, that's <laughs> moisturizer, it's a cleanser. Men just don't think that way. Right. Um, so when... I was dealing with the cosmetic side of things and I was dealing with the men. I was trying to get them to be compliant with skincare because, you know, you can protect your skin. uh, It'll look healthier. It's better for fighting skin cancer, which is probably one of the most common cancers that are out there. And I also found that 4% of men use sunblock daily. And that's a staggering number because, you know, and and then it's very obvious at that time to me that women who use makeup, have SPF built in the makeup products. Okay. And so they're, they're protecting their skin much more than the men are. Um, so the, the idea was to try to get men to use skincare to help protect their skin, to you know, look healthy and, and mm-hmm. protect the skin from, from sun damage. Um, but men only put on two to three products a day. So they'll shave and maybe do an aftershave. <laughs> right. So how do I, take the product lines that are widely out there and you know again uh, the market is replete with new skincare companies whether they're organic and vegan or just general products how can i get men to to fit in that system and i couldn't find an easy system for men so the idea was can i create a skincare line that's very easy to use that men will stay compliant with not change their skincare routine but continue to um, do the routine and have protection 
and also have the anti-aging benefits. So you were, so essentially you were looking at, um, you, you looked at the market and you said, what is out there that I can recommend for my patients and people who come with me questions about this sort of thing. And there wasn't anything, there right? Wasn't and really so you anything. said, there's this void in the market and men had this problem and we need to find some way to fix it. Mainly, you know, skin problems and the fact that I think, you know, outside of a bar of soap, most men don't think much about their Correct. face. But, but even shaving creams even out there now are what I would consider a passive shave. You're putting a foam on, you're shaving, and it's really not doing much to the skin other than shaving the hair. Oh, okay, sure. Um, so I, I really wanted to get, I, I it had an opportunity at that point to, to create a time where if they're putting something on their face, can I put some antioxidants? Can I put some exfoliating agents? Can I put some anti-aging agents within the shave? Because that's a step that they're putting sure, in their face. Sure, sure. That was really a thought. I hadn't really... I didn't develop that thought much until, um, at the same time, right around the same time I was on a business trip and I forgot my shave. And so I did have some, uh, a glycolic acid foaming <laughs> cleanser, um, with me at the time. I still find this hilarious that yeah. you had a, <laughs> I you know, just being in the, in the skincare industry. Right? <laughs> I've got some glycolic yeah. acid in my, yeah, I'm it surprised you got the two. And it foamed a little bit. So I figured, <laughs> you know, uh, I'll shave with that. Cause that's the only, I'm not going to use soap. Right. So okay. I, used the exfoliating cleanser as a shave and it was the best shave I'd had in years. It felt great, clean. Um, my skin felt really, uh, fresh. And so that's when I started really putting those two ideas together and saying, Hey, oh, maybe I, I should make a shave cream that also has a lot of the skincare. I see. In. And so it was, a, it was sort of the accidental scientific discovery, right? Yeah. It was, a, it was an accidental. <laughs> like you accidentally put an extra ingredient in the dish and like, Oh, Hey, this is pretty good or whatever. And that really is when I started actively exploring whether or not there was something out there that had those merits. I see. Um, so at that point, the first step was, you know, I or immediately when I got home, I contacted a local chemist to try to see if I could get a acid cleanser to foam to look more like a shaving cream. Okay. Uh, and that's when I realized through research with that chemist and, and attempts that acids don't foam. You can't make a an acid foam. Oh, yeah. I so okay. if you take an acid cleanser and try to make it foam, it, it won't. And so it's not going to feel like a shave. And most men like the traditional feel. Of it. Sure. Sure. Um, we went through a number of iterations to try to get that to work and it just didn't. Um, so then I was at a, a national meeting, um, and I met a, a world renowned skincare chemist who creates a lot of formulas for big companies. Um, and after having a, a very candid con conversation with her, um, I decided that I would work with her to create a formula that would, um, that would exfoliate the skin, but in a neutral pH environment. So there's a, a, a ingredient called UGL complex. It's a, it's a chemical that exfoliates the skin, has some collagen stimulant factors, but also, um, is not able to foam. So okay. that is the start of kind of the formulation process. So when I talked to uh, the pre my previous guest, Dr. Rice, she was, she developed an app. And so she had no idea, probably similar to you. I mean, from a chemical stamp, from a chemistry standpoint, we had no basic chemistry like sodium and chloride, right? right I mean, exactly. But outside of that sort of thing, we don't have basic. I'd forgotten basic all my organic chemistry. chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I know of the Krebs cycle, but I don't yes. know the Krebs cycle, right? Um, but uh, she said that actually the first thing, she went to developers to find, to help her with the app, similar to you went to developers for a chemist. Uh, but she said she was lucky and that she didn't consult an attorney first. So was, is that, did you consult an attorney to, with the non-disclosure so that your idea wasn't sort of stolen from you or anything like that? Or, uh, you did, know, you, you signed you an NDA later? with the chemist. So, so you had that beforehand with, with the chemist. So you found one before. And so she skipped that step and she went back and she was fine because she would oh. work with scrupulous people. Correct. Um, but. So you, so if in the product moment you have your idea, you sort of, and then you, you want to get an attorney to, for when you go to people and give them your idea, they can't say, Oh, great idea. I'll take that and make my own thing. Right. Well, I didn't even have that in my mind at that point. What I was trying to do is, is figure out if I could even make a formula that would work to my satisfaction okay. before I even thought about going to a company or going anywhere. Okay. Um, and I really wasn't, my end game wasn't to sell to a big company. I just wanted a product that was going to be good for men that I can get my patients to actually use the right, product. Right. I mean, that was really the goal from the start. 
um, and to make it simple so that it, it would really help with my skin, with my patient's skin. And, and that was really the goal. Gotcha. So, you know, the NDA was, was a requirement from her and myself just so that as we're working together, you know, and I knew she wouldn't take the idea and run with it. And so was that more of her idea than the NDA? Because she's most, used to that sort of in the she's industry. Used to that. It's right. It's standard policy. Right. So she's like, this is what we do in non-disclosure agreements so that I'm protected, you're protected and you don't have to worry about that sort of thing. So then, so that's the, so in some ways the inspirational parts look to 1%, right? Right. And then it's the rest is the, the tough stuff, like coming up with the chemical formulations. And so I, I, I had no idea how challenging it would be. I had a concept. I thought it would be simple. You meet with a chemist, you make a product. Right. There are so many steps to have a product. Um, but many, again, many iterations of scent of different, different ingredients. And once you put all these ingredients together, this is why it's really important that I had a world renowned chemist. They have to be compatible with each other. Oh, they sure. have to be almost right. synergistic with each other to work. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can't just throw a pile of ingredients together. And, it, and so um, it was making a formula that also would make it through stability testing because they have to be in containers yeah. for a period of time. So before I even had product containers, what I was going dis- to dispense in, um, we had to first make sure they were stable in a glass construct. So right. you know, once I figured out the formula, and this was five, six months, right. eight months of figuring out a formula. Uh, then it was getting compatibility testing in the, and once that is complete, then you can take it and figure out what, what container, what component, how much volume, all those things. Right. It's sort of like having a kid, right? You think, Oh, I'm just gonna have a kid. And then you see kids who are 18, like, yeah, they just grew up and and you don't realize all the steps involved I, getting I, to that I point. I think back and laugh yeah. because I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Right. I mean, I thought you have a great idea. It's going to be easy. Yeah. And, you know, but, but first and foremost, what kept me going was that I really had the vision of having a product that was going to be, that was going to work really well, that had the, that had great ingredients that would really be efficacious. There's a lot of skincare products out there that yeah. just, it's just filler and there's not a lot. They sell them for a lot, but I wanted this thing, this product, to really work well. Right, and, and in unlike the the previous guest I had, who had an app that was filled a void that truly didn't exist. I mean, in some ways, your product definitely filled in a void that didn't exist at, in your opinion at the time. However, if you want to look for skincare products, like you said, there are a million of them, right? And so you are entering a much different marketplace than she was in trying to get your product out there. So. How did you, what's the next step as far as marketing and sort of getting it out? What, once you have a, a product that's working that you say, and I've got it stable and it's not going to, you know, turn into, you know, liquid goo or something after six months, what's the next, how's, what was your next step to try and get out? Well, so the next step was, all right, now I have the shave part, uh, figured out, but and, but, and let me stop you for a second. At some point you formed a corporation, right? It, it, at yeah, some point along this the, later. Much later. Even we still at this point haven't still made this a car- point, company. No, I, I, okay, I mean, go I, ahead. I hadn't because I didn't really know what I was going to do with with the product. Right. Yeah. Whether you're just going to have yeah, your just, clinic or whatever. It was early. It's kind of a yeah. yeah put sure. your foot in the water a little bit. See how, see if you have a good okay. product. Um, the, the, so then the next step was I still have the problem of you know only four percent of men wearing sunscreen <laughs> right. daily. Yeah, you fixed that. Really not having many of the other attributes to skincare. So. Um, so I, I wanted to create an aftershave because most men will put a shave on and maybe an aftershave. Right. So I wanted to create a, a product that had um, that had soothing qualities afterwards, a moisturizer, because moisturizers are really important once you've exfoliated the skin. Mm-hmm. I wanted to have a product that had broad spectrum SPF, had some other collagen stimulants, really skin brighteners, things to optimize. And because I, I only had two steps to do it. Right. So I went through the same process with the daily moisturizer, which has SPF. So simultaneously, I I did those two products um, to really kind of fit that need of the, of my practice. Assuming, assuming you have a a limited sort of contact with the patient or the the consumer, right? Correct. You're like, I've only got two shots and I got to get everything in. I've got to get as much as I can within reason. And, and, and so if people only decide to shave and do the aftershave, they're really gaining a lot of ground. They're 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 doing the exfoliation. They're doing the collagen stimulants, antioxidants, all those things in that in those products. So once I had those two that were considered stable formulas, there are many many more steps that I had to go through. 
The first was that I had to figure out how I'm going to get it to market right. or how to, how to, so, um, that's when I realized how little I knew <laughs> about what I was getting into. Yeah. Right. So I think it was advice from my dad a long time ago. You know, he said, if you're, if you have your limited information or knowledge in what you're doing, surround yourself with really knowledgeable people. Absolutely. Right. So yeah. that's when I hired a really, really, um, well-respected, uh, marketing firm in California. Okay. Um, and I wanted them and I interviewed a number of different marketing firms and a lot of them wanted to, you know, before we even had clinical studies, before we had anything, they wanted to, you know, spend millions and launch <laughs> right. all over the country. And I really wanted to step back a little and say, I, I first want to treat my patient population. I want to get some clinical trials in. I wanted to go a little bit slower. Yeah. Um, but they gave me some really sage advice, which is you, you really can't have two products in a product line. You have no shelf presence. People, it'll get lost in the shuffle okay. with all the different product lines. Okay. Um, but I still wanted to hold true to my original principle was I want to make this product mm -hmm. line really simple. Um, so with me pulling in one direction, them pulling in another, we came up with a couple more products that still stayed true to the line. So there's a three in one shower cleanser. That's a shampoo face right. body wash has all the, I've heard you, you know, talk about these in the OR. Exactly. Sure. Yeah. The three in one shower. Wash. <laughs> then there's, um, there was a lip balm again, SPF protection. Okay. So a little supplemental. So it had, it created a brand and that's what they're trying I see. to do. So you want to create the brand, the brand in addition to yeah, the Yeah, so the it's, product, a, it's yeah. a branding component. Um, and that process of figuring out the appropriate packages, figuring out the appropriate tubes and pumps, all those things take a lot of time because, you know, you have to, one should be a tube for look, you know, the, the appearance on the shelf. Okay. Uh, one has to be a pump, one, you know, the, just to give the, the appropriate appearance on the shelf. And that's what the marketing firm really does. Sure. And the coloring and the... the the way the script is uh, on the tubes. But while that's simulta simultaneously happening, I had to, because I have an SPF product, I have to work with the FDA oh. from a regulatory standpoint. So I have to make sure that um, all the skin testing is done, all the SPF testing is done, and there's new guidelines in terms of, of sun protection. So right. you know, I can't just sell a product if it's not, hasn't gone through i can't label it as a broad spectrum spf unless i have the appropriate testing it's like the gas mileage in a car right you have to verify that yes it gets with you yeah. okay and and i don't you know as a physician i don't want to fudge anything there's a lot of products out there that that label and haven't gone through regulatory and they're just risking it uh -huh. for me my reputation's on the line so i really had to go through all right. the hoops to make sure that it's on board and um so there are the sensitivity tests. I wanted to have the product meet to be non-comedogenic, which means it doesn't clog the pores. So those had to go through separate oh, okay. tests. There's all these clinical trials that they had to do. Oh, and, my. you know, God forbid that it, they didn't pass. I would have had to start the whole process all over again. So that's, again, why it was important for me to have a chemist, a, a world-renowned chemist, to help me with the formulas to make sure that they okay. were going to pass the, the test. Um, so then... Once you figure out the appropriate containers that you're going to put the goop in, the goop is the product, right? <laughs> um, then you have to go through compatibility tests with those tubes because the different plastics or whatever different plastics, mm -hmm. and so so that whole process again is a six eight month process. Now, so how far are we in at this point after you get through these compatibility? Are we like three so, years past? I mean, from the yeah, from we're initial like right contact with that chemist. How long are we in at this point? Probably two years. Two years. Okay. Two years. And the, the challenge, you know, again, nothing goes smoothly. Well, of um, course not. <laughs> so the shave is a, it's a liquid as it comes out and it's a self foaming construct. So you, you just, when it, when it touches air and water, it, it expands. Okay. Uh, we went through no fewer than 10 to 15 containers that would make it to the two and a half month mark in terms of compatibility and then just burst. Oh, so it, they, it's not like just leaving it on a shelf. They no, put I mean, it at a hundred degrees and freeze it and a hundred degrees and right. freeze it and put it in a car. So it went through all these tests. And so the frustration for me was then you have to start the three month right. over so you again. almost made it and then you start over again. Exactly. Okay. So I had to find a very unique, um, it's called bag on valve. It's, it has a 
can with a bag on the inside, a bladder on the inside that oh. holds it, and it's a, a special way of dispensing with external pressure. So sounds you know, expensive. It, it was, it, yeah, <laughs> believe me, it was it was way way more expensive than I anticipated. Okay, yeah. and and at this point, I mean, you've got, obviously you feel like you got a product that's going to work, and it, and it's and you're fairly certain that people would like it. You don't know if you can convince the four percent to purchase it and then you can't you're not sure if you can make it eight or ten or twelve percent right that's ultimately what you're hoping too to try and make it easy for men right totally and at this point you're probably although you're convinced it's going to work you're in i mean you've spent some serious money at this point uh, yes, right it was it was i mean it would but you know it, each step of the way i thought that it was getting near and right. you just keep you know you keep contributing and you know I, again it, it it wasn't the goal wasn't to make a massive corporation the idea was just to get products launched. Right. No, the, I mean, I mean, yeah. you believe in the product, right? And you think this is what I want. And at some point it's like your, it's sure your baby, right? You want to make sure it gets to yeah. where it, and cause you think this is going to work. This works. I seem to get the way to get it there. And and then, so now you have something in the, and now you have the, your goop in a tube, right now, how, and the marketing firm is going to help you launch it right into an incredibly complicated or crowded market. Crowded place. market. So I know initially I was talking to you like doing some talk shows or at least magazines or something like that. And that was a couple of years ago now. That was a couple of years ago. Yeah. So just before we decided to launch though, my, my, you have to really kind of pick the channel you want to launch in. Okay. You, know, you can pick in, um, in a retail store, uh, you can department stores, mm-hmm. um, it, the prestige product lines are really going more into the professional market. And so if you, you know, if you, if you, we decided that because this is a unique product sitting on the shelf, people wouldn't really understand the merits of the brand. They wouldn't recognize, they, they the, wouldn't value. recognize the value sure. of all the ingredients that are in there. They would just look and say, okay, this is a shave and this is a shave. This one's a dollar 99, right. this $20. You know how I shop, don't you? He, well, we all, all men <laughs> shop like that. So, uh, so there are a couple of things we, we, we had to, we picked the channel and then in order to be in the professional channel with estheticians, dermatologists, plastic surgeons, you really kind of have to have clinical trials for people to really believe in the product before they've seen it or felt to it. To recognize there's value. To recognize there's, there's value. extra stuff with there's it. Actually, not just, yeah, it, right. There's efficacy. Um, so that was the next step before we launched really was getting some clinical trials and then having a very, and a company does it. So, the, you know, obviously I felt that. So it wasn't like plastic surgery residents they were using? No, it wasn't plastic. It was, it was actually, you know, you, you pay, you right. have a hundred people use the product, detailed questionnaires, and this is a, a professional company that does it. Okay. And it's a very unbiased process. Um, once we got the value back from that and, and there was affirmation that the product works well and it was well liked by the, the, the people who went through the skin wasn't trials. sloughing off, right? No, good. It was, you know, they noticed a difference. Yeah, they yeah, felt yeah. a difference. It was, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and they didn't change their normal routine again. It's oh, they're, right. they're not the having to put five other products right. on because, you know, people do that for a little while. Um, that's when we decided that we were going to launch and that's where the marketing firm then uh, assisted with where to go and where to launch. Is that when you sort of said, okay, I'm going to create the company. So now I can have the, I'm going to, that's where you had the that's company when, at that's that point. You You're like, company. okay. Once you have the name of the product, so right. Turo, once Turo was that name, I see. that was trademarked. Then you have to go through the whole trademarking process right. of, you know, <laughs> uh, looking through <laughs> and trademarking, you know, it just kept on building it's and like building unraveling and a sweater. building and building. And so, uh, the marketing firm was very insightful because obviously they had, they had well, they launched a number of brands. Yeah, sure. Um, but they were more of a, in most places are more retail launch. Mm-hmm. So this was slightly different because it was the professional channel. Um, and I, you know, with dermatologists and plastic surgeons and, you know, I felt comfortable with that and I didn't want to do a big national launch. I want to just do more regional. And you're talking to your peers, right? I mean, as a physician, it's a little bit easier talking to other physicians because we kind Correct. of, yeah, we just under, uh, talk the same language and have the same goals and some level, right? So, so long process, that's like six years. The launch was in 2011, 12. Has it been that long? Okay, so twelve. So that's so it was about four years or so. Yeah, four to five years. You got four to five years, and so still out there now. Well, let me just oh, let me say one more. Wait, thing there's because, more. You know, yeah, well, there's more. <laughs> Once you have your product and you have the concept of what you're going to launch, yeah. now you have to find a manufacturer 
Oh, sure. Of I, all I your assume tubes. that was already no, figured out. You have to figure out a manufacturer for all the tubes. Oh, you my. have to figure out uh, what laboratory is going to reliably construct your formula uh, with right. the assistance of your chemist. Not mess it up uh, every... Right? And, and then comes all the lead times with all the ingredients that are coming from all over. Um, and then the compatibility tests that they have to run, the FDA clearance with them. And that was a process, mm -hmm. which is ultimately what brought us up to 2012. I see. And so, and so then you have a product and now you're, and then you're, and then that's when you're starting to do the publicity. You're going to conferences, I imagine, right? You're going to trade shows uh, just to get the product out so people can try it. Um, and, you know, I guess early on it was recommended that, um, you have a PR firm that, mm -hmm. sure. um, gives the product to magazines so that authorities can try it out right. and, and make a statement on it, whether it's good or bad. I, I wanted very, yeah. you know, candid, sure. um, wow, it's a long process. It's much, I mean, obviously it's much longer so, than anticipated. I, I mean, it looking now when you look it, like most things, once you've gotten to the end and look back, you're like, oh, that was, you know, kind of a neat experience. I learned a lot. It was, and I came out with the result I wanted, maybe not the same, the, the rate of the speed as fast, you know, like wanted. There are probably many times during that, during that process, you're like, what am I doing? Right? Well, I mean, you're just like, this is crazy. All these problems and setbacks, right? I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Right. And obviously I had the ambition to, to see it to fruition, but every step of the way there are setbacks with timing there's setbacks with you know if a manufacturer produces um makes a run of your product but it's not to your standards then yeah. you have to then now you don't have enough on the shelf and then you have to deal with lead times and and the the offices and the spas want to have it but now you have to <laughs> right. wait another three months because the product wasn't to your standards um so all those things that i never anticipated that you know if i operate yeah, until five o'clock I'm at home. Thankfully they were all located in California. So right. there's a time change. And so a lot of my <laughs> evenings were spent dealing with the manufacturers, dealing with the, uh, the tube manufacturers. And th this wasn't a 50 person organization. This was, you know, three of us yeah, that, right. were, that were running it. And so, you know, I learned a lot about regulatory, about product branding, about, you know, labeling the FDA, all these things that, that, I don't regret at all. I mean, it was a great experience. Yeah. It's just a long process. I mean, it, it's a testament, right? If you want to do something special, it takes, there's the perseverance is absolutely the, I mean, the inspiration is, is necessary, but it's the perseverance and the actual, you know, the doggedness just kind of just drive to the end. Right. I mean, I felt like that with medical school, like at everyone in their second year is like, what am I doing? This yeah. is dumb. It's, I should go. Why are my, my friends, friends are having, out and about? Yeah, and they've I'm got here. jobs or careers or something. I'm, this sucks. You're right. <laughs> Medical school is that terrible. That all washes away once you graduate. Yeah. yeah. Once And once you get out in residency and you're like, oh, this is actually kind of fun. And actually yeah. for me, it wasn't until I was a staff clinician, like, um, NCL, I was like, oh, this is actually kind of fun. But even as a resident, you're kind of like, I don't know if this is the right thing. You have a little more autonomy, I think, in it, plastic, but you're still also working under staff who might drive you crazy. You're like, I think I'll like this. I'm pretty sure, but... You're never sure until you kind of get never out and sure, do yeah. it, right? And, and I'm very thankful I chose the career I did. I, I love every day. So yeah, I mean, a, I have fun working with you guys it. and working with like other surgeons and stuff. I'm, I've, but again, it's you have to get through it. But for these product launches, there's a lot, a lot involved, and and probably I'm sure many times you're like, I should probably just, you know, it's not worth the hassle. It, it's not, but but I still, you know, again, I with with skin cancer as prevalent as it is. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's just, it's a need for people to be more compliant with skincare. It's simple. It's a totally preventable disease. People can have, you know, wear it. This is the part men really view women's skin as being sensitive. So they need to wear a sunblock. Right. Whereas men <laughs> think, Oh, my skin's pretty hardy. Um, the, the problem is, you know, they, they also associate sunblocks with thick, pasty, heavy white glow on the skin you know, greasy. Right. Yeah. And, and that's, that's it, many more hurdles that I ever, that I never would have imagined. So, you know, it's getting the message out that it can be very thin, lightweight, you know, feels comfortable, moisturizes, but it has the same protection, yeah. all those messages. Um, that's, you know, that's the battle. Do you feel like it, your product, so it's been six years now, right? How's the growth been? Is it still continuing it's good, to grow yeah, steady. a little bit? It's just, yeah, it's, it's growing and it's, you know, we, there's a lot of distribution in California. Okay. Um, and partly that's because that's where we had 
They have sun. Uh, yeah, they have sun. <laughs> yes, yeah, so that's a necessary ingredient. Um, <laughs> but it's it's also just I think people are aware a little bit more of protecting their skin and the benefits yeah, sure. of, of doing um, skincare. Um, and I think men are more and more aware of, of needing to, to protect their skin and, and have a healthy glow. And that's, you know, you can see in our, in our industry alone with lasers and surgical procedures in men, it's really gone up a lot in the last five to 10 years. Men want to look healthy. They want to feel healthy. And part of that is, um, avoiding the aging process. And that's the, you know, 90% of what you see on the face is aging is all ultraviolet damage. Sure. So sunspots, fine lines, wrinkles, right. all those things. So they kind of go hand in hand with, with what I do. I really, in order to get the, the best end point, you really need to protect your skin. And, and basal cells really suck. Ba- getting them off your nose and yeah, off your those nose, most procedures and, and stuff. And, and yeah, it's ears. A, it's a very, very common. Um, yeah. I remember my grandpa had a bunch of them off the top of his head, which also helps to have hair. I thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. But you know, it, it's it's interesting. I, just as an aside, I, I it's been a fun process because I've seen the evolution of the brand, and I've seen, you know, how it resonates with even women now. And so a lot of women are using the products because they're very efficient. Sure. Um, so yeah. they don't also want to use fifteen products in a given day. It's just not. They're willing to, but they'd rather not. To, like anyone, not. they'd rather cut their time. I mean, saves you ten minutes a day or something, right? Or whatever. I don't know how long it takes That's to right. put all that stuff on. It's very complicated. I look at it, it's like a some sort of complicated jigsaw puzzle on our on our bathroom counter. I don't know how my wife. <laughs> That's what I wanted <laughs> to avoid. Yeah, right. very simple, simplify, but get all the important ingredients. That's the. I figure if I put deodorant on, I'm pretty good for the day. So if, <laughs> <That's> I, <laughs> call it if I add anything more, it's just a bonus. So, yeah. um, well, thanks a lot for the conversation. I, it's been really fascinating. Um, anything else uh, that you have to add about the process for people who are listening to this who might be docs or. Really, you don't have to be a physician to kind of go through this process either. But anybody yeah, starts I, business. you know, again, I think it's it's never an easy process. So you really have to be passionate about what your goal is and and see it through and surround yourself with the right people because that's what will help you navigate the whole process. Because looking back, I I, I was I think I was very fortunate to pick the right people and align with the right organizations to carry it through despite all the little bumps in the road. Right. And so I think that's what made it through. Yeah. And, and just, I suppose, just to make sure, just know that it's going to work. I expect the problems, but be ready to just kind of plow right. through them. Right. And be realistic. Yeah. You know, I was ready at the, at the moment that if nobody liked the shave and nobody liked the moisturizer, yep. it was an idea. I ran with it and yeah. that was it. Right. Okay. So if you want to find out more about Turo, where do they go to find out more? Uh, the website is turoskin.com. And that's T-U-R-O dot, yes. t- I'm sorry, turoskin? Turoskin.com. Okay. And if they want to find more about you, is there a place to, you don't, do you have much of a social media presence? I or, have information on the, on the website. On there. the website, they can contact you there. So yeah. don't call you at your house. No, they're them. welcome to call if they have questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll set them straight with reality. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, hey, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. It's a fun t- discussion. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Thanks for listening to The Paradox. If you like what The Doc is doing, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher. And share the show with your friends. Become a supporting listener to get access to special bonuses at patreon.com forward slash the paradox. Show notes can be found at theparadox.com. And urologist. Yep. Where are you located? I'm in the Washington D.C. area. I'm oh. in Virginia. In Mordor. Okay. Yeah, Northern Virginia. <laughs>